Dr. Brittany. Yes. Um, <laughs> could I turn it over to you and tell us a little bit about who you are um, sure. and what you do to the to the night? Of course. Well, thanks everyone for coming. Um, I hope I can provide some helpful information and uh, answer some questions and, and put everybody at ease because hopefully a lot of like uh, positive reassurance is, is what I hope to bring to the talk. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, I grew up in Westchester, New York, um, and then I went out to the Midwest for college um, to the University of Michigan, go blue. Um, and then I went to med school in Chicago. And after spending eight years in the Midwest, I was ready to come back to New York, which is where I ended up in a Maria Ferreri Children's Hospital, which is part of Westchester Medical Center. Um, and after completing residency in pediatrics, I joined Tribeca Pediatrics, um, which I've been practicing as a general pediatrician for the past six years now. Um, and uh, I'm a mom myself. Uh, so if you hear crazy chaos in the background, it's a one to three situation with my husband and the three little dudes. Um, I have a four-year-old and twin two-year-olds. Um, so it's a wild time, but uh, it's great. It's really fun. Um, and, you know, I, I think just to jump into like the first question, like how do you pick a pediatrician? Um, you know, I think three things come to mind um, in, in which I think are important. So the first thing is I would pick a pediatrician that's easy to get to, obviously with children, um, getting out of the house is a little bit different than before you had kids. Um, so pick uh, office that's easy for you to get to that accepts your insurance um, and isn't so far away from your home so you can jump in if ever you need to. Uh, the second thing that I think is really important is access to doctors or providers. So, um, you know, obviously you're going to see a pediatrician and, and I think most people like to pick a doctor or provider and, and stick with that person because it's a really nice relationship to have. Um, you come for a lot of well visits, especially in the first year of life um, with your child, not even counting unanticipated sick visits. So just with well visits, you'd come for about nine visits in the first year. So it's nice to have a familiar face, pick up the conversation where you left off. Um, so, so finding a doctor that you resonate with is, is truly important. But I think access to doctors. So um, when you're home and you have a question, you wanna make sure that if you call or you email, you can get a fast response. Um, and I think one of the things that we do at Tribeca Pediatrics, which is really nice, is we have a medical provider on call 24 hours a day. So yes, you know our office hours are open and, and in the Warren Street location, we're open eight to eight Monday uh, through Friday, and then on the weekends, nine to four, both Saturday and Sunday. So a lot of access to come in and, and get seen if you need to, even for like an unanticipated visit on the weekends. Um, and then, you know, at night when we're not in the office, you know, the phones go directly to the doctor or provider on call, which is really nice because um, hopefully you never need to call at three in the morning, but if something's wrong with your kid and, and you know, you, things aren't right, you want to talk to a doctor or, or a provider within minutes. So one of the nice things is we'll put you, when you call our office, you go directly to the doctor on call cell phone um, when you call at night, which is really cool. Um, but yes, I would ask about access to your pediatrician, not only during office hours, but what those office hours are and um, what to do when the office is closed. And, and then not the to be, and not to be afraid to ask or not to be feel like that's it's too polite, but to really be able to be empowered to say, I can, I truly can pick up the phone for anything and, and it's welcomed for me. Yes, yes, because you know, you should get an answer. Um, we want you to ask questions, you know, and, and sometimes you, you need to know in that minute, it can't always wait. Um, and then I guess the third thing I, I would just say is, is pick a doctor or an office that shares your philosophy. So um, you know, we try to be low intervention at Tribeca Pediatrics, you know, um, you know, only provide medication when it's needed, try to do a lot of uh, preventative care and talk about behavioral stuff. Um, and I think, uh, you know, finding an office that shares your philosophy or a doctor you connect with is really important because, as I said, nine visits just for the well stuff is a lot. So it's, it's a really cool relationship to have with your pediatrician. Mm -hmm. Do you find as a pediatrician and as a mom who goes to the pediatrician, you are, are you more risk averse? Are you less risk averse? Or did, did you, I how, think I'm, how did that change or not change? 
Yeah, I think I'm more relaxed because I know, um, you know, I can identify the medical health of my kids. So I'm not worried as much about bumps and scrapes and coughs and things like that. Um, but I definitely don't know why my kids are crying and screaming and tantruming. And I felt like a first time mom getting my like stroller into the office and dealing with the gear. So I definitely have um, so much respect for parents and I've been there and I am there and I don't always know the answer, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good thing to look for in a, a pediatrician. I think someone who's kind of been there and, and is on the journey with you. So thank you for that. Um, so I'll jump to the next slide and if you want to just share um, some of the things we're going to be talking to and and why that would be amazing. Yeah, so I you know obviously COVID and I know it's the big topic of 2020 and creeping into 2021 but I'm going to try to talk about um, sort of the general reasons why kids get sick. Um, when to worry, what the basic treatments are, um, just so you guys have a preview of things um, sort of as we anticipate them to go back to more normal in the next uh, few weeks, months, soon. <laughs> yeah, that's exciting. My son just was getting over a cold and uh, I found it's the first time, he's had a couple colds since, but it's the first time that I haven't just like skyrocketed the stress and said, okay, what are the basics here? How do I, how do I deal with it? So um, sounds like you're going to be jumping into that. Yes. Uh, yeah, perfect. All right. Um, so the first topic is colds, which are virus upper respiratory infections. And of course, you know, with COVID, COVID is a virus and it kind of most often presents as a cold in kids. Um, but even if you have the diagnosis of COVID, it doesn't really change the treatment. So I'm gonna talk about general codes, colds, but this pertains to almost like a COVID situation as well. Yeah. Um, so what a cold is, it's an infection that really manifests in your nose um, and it's caused by many different viruses um, and causes things to be inflamed, you to make mucus, things to just be red and angry. And kids generally usually have a fever associated with it. Um, they don't wanna eat as much, they feel sick. Sometimes they have some loose poop, you know, swallowing a lot of mucus, it comes out the other end. Um, and they can have like a post nasal drip, which, which manifests oftentimes as a sore throat. And it probably looks worse on, it was stunning for me to see it on my child because I I saw it just, you know, goo oozing out and mucus oozing out. And then you have to sort of train yourself to remember, oh, they don't know how to blow their nose. Like their nasal cavities are so tiny. Like it, it might look a little bit worse than it really is potentially yeah. too. Yes. yes, the management of secretions is the challenge for sure. <laughs> Whole topic. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Bring it up on the next slide. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so colds in general, there really isn't a treatment. And again, that sort of goes with COVID too. Getting the diagnosis of COVID doesn't mean you get a certain medicine. You kind of have to ride it out. You just have to watch your kid a little closer and quarantine them a little differently. But in general, colds, non-COVID usually last about three to seven days. Um, there's not a pill that makes it better because colds are viruses. There isn't an antiviral pill that's around. And really, you know, the treatment is man managing your kids' secretions and making them comfortable, which can be hard, especially like in babies. So, you know, some things you can try to help kind of mobilize the mucus is, is use a little nasal saline, suction it out, even do like a little steam shower, turn the hot water on in the shower, make it kind of like a sauna in the bathroom and let your kid play on the floor, just a way to kind of drain the mucus out. Um, gravity, so if your kid's, uh, you know, a little bit younger and, and you can kind of control how they sleep, putting a pillow underneath their mattress, because of course young babies, you don't want to put anything in their crib or angling their head up a little uh, more if they're an older kid, an extra pillow underneath them. Um, and uh, usually, you know, managing their temperature, or their pain with Tylenol or Motrin. Um, decongestants sometimes can be used, but often there's some negative side effects. So I would definitely consult your pediatrician before kind of giving medicine to your child, but um, really trying to handle the secretions is, is the best uh, treatment. When you see all of this, are you suggesting that um, parents potentially give it a couple days before 
coming in? Is this, is this more of a self-monitor kind of thing? Yeah. Yeah. Usually I would say, you know, um, if the fever or the symptoms kind of go past day three and they're getting worse, um, or if at any time you're concerned about your child's breathing, Mm -hmm. um, those are sort of the reasons to come in, but day one, day two of fever, runny nose, if it hits day three and it's still going up, that's sort of when we decide to maybe check in with our office. So I'm gonna go to that slide then. Sure. Um, so colds can last a really long time. Usually, you know, they kind of run their course over a week, but the mucus can last multiple weeks. Um, and often kids, especially if they're around other kids, um, you know, in daycare, in school, a baby that has an older sibling that's around other kids, you know, they can get back to back cold. So it's not evidence of like a weak immune system or anything's wrong. It's just kids are really cute, but they're a little gross sometimes and they lick stuff and they're snotty and uh, they get germs, but it's, it's not a bad thing. And it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong. Can I ask two questions? I think you and I were chatting with and in like any time you start school. So let's say if you're not in a child care center and your home, but then you start to do preschool or you start to do kindergarten and you, you probably see a wave of that happening. It's just a different timing according to the group environment. Totally. Yes. And I think in a way, you know, if your child's around other kids, like before kindergarten, um, you sort of bang out a few of these colds and viruses um, at an earlier age and in a way they're more prepared and maybe won't get a sick in kindergarten. So at least that's what I'm telling myself for my Yeah, own. yeah. You'll probably <laughs> touch on this on a couple of, I know I'm like, the, they're going to be so tough by kindergarten. It's going to be, they're going to be out there licking poles and they'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I know we had a question about seasonal um, flu season or cold season and, and when the changes of seasons, is there anything um, that could be said as far as preventative um, precautions for, for looking out for the first, the season where colds could jump about? Yeah, you know, it, it, it's hard because some of it is preventable and some of it, some of it is, is not preventable. Um, you know, um, I think we'll sort of get into seasonal allergies in a minute, but um, those sorts of things, you know, have a seasonal curve, you know, certain pollens, you know, transition time, spring to fall, you can kind of anticipate that that's coming and maybe your kid has had some issues in the past. So that's helpful. Um, but in general, I mean, I think, you know, for the flu season, um, you know, just being extra vigilant about wiping noses. And we've seen that like masks and hand sanitizer and these things do work. So washing your kids' hands, but at the same time, don't freak out if they drop something on the floor and lick it, it's, it's life, you know? <laughs> right, right. So easy to say. Um, I'll yeah. jump to the next one. Um, so yeah, the hard thing I think sometimes with colds is distinguishing them between allergies and what's a cold. Um, one of the benchmarks is allergies take a few seasons to develop. So you rarely see seasonal allergies in kids under two. So mm -hmm. for the first two years of life, it's, it's mainly colds. Yeah. That was a um, I was one of the myths ask. about <laughs> So oh, two, years is about the, two years is about the time where you could say, oh, it could be an allergy, but yeah. prior to that, typically. Yes, because you've sort of had a season, two, one or two seasons to be exposed and your body's kind of charged for it. Um, one of the things people think is that mucus color is really important, but it doesn't really have to do with the severity of, of illness. Um, another myth is that people think dairy creates more mucus. That's not true. Um, honestly, when you eat dairy and you're sick, sometimes you can have a little stomach issue, but it doesn't contribute to creating more mucus. Um, and being contagious with a cold, uh, you know, basically when you've been fever free for 24 to 48 hours, you're considered safe. Obviously, COVID's a different animal, um, but it gets less contagious as uh, time goes on. Um, so this brings us to seasonal allergies, which look a lot like colds, but the symptoms are more chronic. They last more than a week or two, and they happen at about the same time every year. So there's some overlap with the congestion, the stuffiness, but you usually have a little bit more like 
pink and itchy eyes, a little bit more sneezing. Um, seasonal allergies can also exacerbate other inflammatory uh, conditions. So eczema, if your kid has a predisposition for wheezing, a little asthma. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I, I think it can be confusing at times, but they generally don't have a fever is the other piece of it. That is the other thing to consider is if you're not seeing a fever and it's typically around the same time of year, think through it. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have a, 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 is there any baseline where you would start to recommend going to an allergist or is it sort of one size fits one? Yeah, it's a conversation. I think um, the hard thing with seasonal allergies is although you want to avoid triggers once you identify them. Um, certain triggers are like grass and going outside, which of course we don't want your child to avoid doing that. Um, so if it seems like it's an environmental allergy, you don't have to necessarily run to an allergist because the treatment is really over the counter management of symptoms. Um, I think when it's helpful to go to an allergist is if you can identify exactly what the triggers are, it seems to be lasting a longer time. And one of the things that's helpful to know is if your kid has a dust mite allergy, because that may trigger you to change, um, you know, over uh, materials and, and bedding and things like that in your house. So um, I don't think to, to call somebody having seasonal allergies, you necessarily need to go to an allergist, um, but because uh, the management is mostly over the counter, but definitely there's times where, where in a little extra information is helpful. That makes sense. I love this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just a basic chart about things and what month they sort of act up. And if you kind of look at it, you know, it's like the transition seasons, the spring and the fall, that's when times are tough. <laughs> There's literally no month on there that's free of anything. Yeah. yeah. Oh, poor life of allergies. Um, so what do you do if you have allergies? You avoid it, again, as much as possible. Still send your kids outside. But if you know it's high pollen count time and they've got a pollen allergy, maybe change their clothes when they come in. Wash their hands. Um, you can shower them if, if you know, you're so inclined. Um, keep the window shut and put on the AC instead of letting the pollen kind of drift through the house. Um, and then really it's, it's about management of symptoms. So if your kid's just super cough, sneezy, snotty. Um, I think taking an oral antihistamine, which is over the counter, they make liquid for younger kids um, is helpful. But if it's mostly nose, you know, you can do a nasal spray, or if it's mostly eyes, you can do the eye drops. So you sort of titrate the treatment based on, on your child's symptoms. And then if it's really serious, I mean, there are allergy shots and things that can help you kind of theoretically resolve your seasonal allergies. But at that point, you're, you're seeing a pediatric allergist. <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, all right so teething um i think this is something i talk a lot about um and traditionally it starts at about six to eight months of age i have seen teeth in a few four month olds but it's rare um but definitely the oral phase begins around four months or earlier where kids are kind of putting stuff in their mouth lots of drool um and you get 20 teeth by the time you're two, and then you get another set of molars between two and three. So a lot of teeth come in, but it doesn't mean that it's like a rough, you know, two years, you know, it waxes, it wanes, and, and it usually lasts a few days, and it's not painful for everyone. That's a great um, thing. I, I almost want you to say that all again, because there'll be some times when a tooth will come in, and you won't even have a, you wouldn't have experienced any emotions around it. And then just when you're least expecting it, something is feeling a little bit rough and you never really know when that's going to be or what that's going to be. Every child's really different in how they come in. Um, okay. And the, the process lasts up until about three years old, which is, is crazy. Yeah. Um, this is sort of the typical eruption of teeth, but again, not everybody follows the mold, but you usually get the bottom two uh, central incisors, then the top two come, the laterals, then the um, molars, and then the canines fill in last. Um, but I think it's cute when they come in differently too. <laughs> I know. The whole process is really cute. Yeah. 
Um, so what do you do for teething? I mean, really um, cold um, things kind of confuse pain receptors. So I often encourage people to, you know, freeze a bagel, freeze a banana, let your kid kind of gnaw on it because that pressure of the frozen food can be helpful um, for the confusing of the pain receptors with the cold and also just putting pressure on the gums. Um, topical anesthetics used to be recommended, but they're not anymore. Um, benzocaine was one that was used to, like Origel used to be recommended, but in overdosed amounts or, or high doses, it can actually like displace oxygen from the blood, like crazy stuff you don't even want to know about. So don't go there. Um, really, uh, the FDA recommends not giving any of it. Um, other things people try, there are these amber teething necklaces that are super cute accessory pieces, but they can be choking hazards and they actually can choke kids. So we don't recommend them either. Um, there's homeopathic tablets, but the levels are often unregulated. Um, brandy or booze is definitely an old school way to deal with teething. We can't really recommend that anymore. I can't speak to if it works or not because we just don't do it anymore. Um, you can pour yourself a brandy. In, totally. Yes, in sympathy of your child. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely don't waste it on your kid. Drink it yourself. Um, and then really it's kind of like counter pressure cold and then good old Tylenol and Motrin. Yeah. Is Tylenol and Motrin reminds me of uh, not just teething, but from from an early age. Um, is there a, an, a too early for medicine time frame? Or I know a lot of that is a conversation with your own pediatrician, but kind of yeah. guidelines for for Tylenol and Motrin. Yeah, so Tylenol, um, they're both weight-based dosing. Um, so definitely get the dose from your pediatrician. Um, but uh, Tylenol you can give to like a baby, you know, a few days old, even if you needed to, not that you need to, but um, Tylenol is safe pretty much, uh, you know, from when you're born. But Motrin, we don't give to children until they're six months. Um, and you may find that for some kids, Motrin works better, but you got to wait till they're six months to use it. And how do you do you, um, recommend, not recommend? I know the Tylenol is sort of a four hour, the Motrin is a six hour. And I've, I've definitely had recommendations of you can kind of use them ongoing. The two of them can kind of go together. Is that a thing? Yes, that's totally a thing. Okay. Um, they work differently. They have like different mechanisms of action. So, um, Basically, you know, you start with one and if you need a dose of something before that time frame is up, you can give the other one. Got Does it. That make sense? Yep. Yep. That's a good tool to have. <laughs> um, all right. So some other like kind of myths of teething. Um, everybody thinks teething causes fevers. I mean, I did too, um, but they did a medical study and looked at it and um, Teething just really raises the temperature 0.12 degrees. So you can't really blame a fever on teething. You know, your kid can feel a little warm, they can be fussy, but if your kid has, you know, a temperature of above 100.4, it's probably something else. Um, rashes, diarrhea, yes, teething, you know, you get a lot of drool, you get irritation around your mouth, definitely see rashes like that. Um, but like a full blo a body rash, you can't blame it on the teeth, you know, diarrhea, Yes, they swallow more fluid because they're just drooling a ton, but full-blown diarrhea also can't blame on the teething. Um, another myth is that it only occurs at night. Um, that's not true. I mean, kids are a little distract less distracted at night and a little more sensitive. So it makes sense that symptoms seem worse at that point, but you don't want to completely break the routine and be in a you know bad rhythm of, you know, cuddling your kid every night or going to them every time they cry just because they're teething. Um, you sort of have to, to figure out what it is, give them a little medicine or, or loving and, and kind of move on. Um, another myth is that seeing the teeth always means that, you know, it's worse. And we sort of talked about this, you know, some teeth will just pop up and you didn't even know your kid was teething. Um, everybody's architecture of their nerves and their mouth are a little bit different. So some kids get pain when it's non-visible tooth. Other kids pop 20 teeth out and hardly have a problem. So it's not always bad. It feels bad at night. I love, I love that moment. It's really not that it's worse at night. It's just that you're 
all trying to sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's always worse at night. Yeah, it really is. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about ear infections and I'm going to talk about middle ear infections, um, which are like the ear infections that require antibiotics, not like a swimmer's ear. Um, so this is the anatomy of ear, an ear, it's kind of an intense picture, but basically what we're looking at is ear infections that happen behind the tympanic membrane, which is sort of that pink balloon in the picture. Um, and you can see in, in the bottom, that little square, when you get fluid building up in there, that's sort of what an ear infection looks like from, from the inside. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can kind of see what we mm -hmm. see when we look through our, your kid's ear um, with our otoscope. So the left ear is a normal ear. You sort of see that clear balloon, a few bones behind it. Um, and then the right ear looks abnormal. Um, there's the white pus behind the balloon. You can't see the bones. Um, there's redness. It's irritated. It's swollen. Um, so the right ear is infected. Um, are you, obviously this is in the top 10 of your talk, so I'm imagining it happens quite frequently with um, children in zero to five. And is it because there, there's just not a lot of space for the nose and the ears and all the stuff that's going on that there's just not a lot to move around or? Yeah, so basically, um, you know, ear infections usually occur because a kid gets a cold or a virus and you get like congestion in your sinuses and there's really no drainage because you have so much mucus kind of in your sinuses that your eustachian tubes or your ears can't really drain. So it's sort of like these viruses cause a backup in, you know, kind of pressure and fluid. And if the fluid hangs out there long enough, it can become bacterial. So sort of because kids get a lot of colds, also another aspect of it is just kids' ears, the angle of their canals is funky and as it grows it gets a little bit better so the fluid just kind of likes to pool and sit sit there yeah that makes sense so it's not necessarily that they get the the ear infection first it's that something a virus has caused the ear infection yes exactly thank you yeah um so what do you do for an ear infection i mean you keep your kid comfortable good old tylenol and motrin um the golden duo um and then there's sort of two options for treatment and we, and we use the options um, or, you know, treatment plan based on age for a kid. So if your baby's less than six months, um, we'll usually start antibiotics if we look in their ear and see, see a, you know, ear infection. However, if your kid's a little bit older, um, if they're older than two years, we'll watch and wait because a lot of times, as we talked about, these are viruses, you know, cold viruses that just sort of hang out in the ear. And usually they resolve on their own because medicine or, or, you know, antibiotics don't cure a virus. Um, however, if things are going on for more than two to three days, your kid's still in pain, their fever is not getting better, that's sort of an indication that maybe that fluid bred something bacterial and we got to do antibiotics. So um, if it goes on for more than two to three days, we start the antibiotics. And if you're in that in-between age group, the six months to two years, kind of depending on the situation, we usually try to watch and wait, but there's a lower threshold to start antibiotics than if your kid's a little older. And if we've got parents from home at, at home trying to think through, you know, what, aside from maybe pulling on the ear, you don't, you can't really assess your own child's ear infection. And so yeah. really this would be a come in if you're get your kids getting these zero like that. Yeah, I mean, it's like fever, really pain, really fussy, pulling on the ear. Usually there's a cold that's going along with it. Um, things aren't getting better. It's kind of time. Yeah. Um, so a recurrent ear infection, that would be if it happens within 30 days of an initial infection. And in that case, you know, you may need to try a different antibiotic to treat it. Um, there are some kids because of their anatomy that, that get multiple ear infections in a year. Um, so if you have more than four in a year, that's sort of when you'd see a specialist to talk about, um, is there anything that needs to be done? Um, ear tubes, intervention, more antibiotics. Um, also sometimes adenoids are in the sinus in, in sort of the space and can cause, um, you know, or big adenoids are a recipe for multiple ear infections. So that's something you need to see an ear, nose and throat doctor about. 
Um, and they usually happen ear infections um, when kids are babies till about they're six years old and then they usually go away. So this isn't something hopefully you're dealing with forever. I was um, fortunate enough to have our son deal with it forever. And, and it, we were right about that. It must be the, the same baseline, um, the plus or minus for infections. And we were referred to um, an ear, nose and throat and subsequently got tubes, which was life-changing. And so not a, not a scary thing once you go through it, but it's nice to know that that's kind of your baseline to say, you know what, I think we need to get another community member involved in this. Yeah, yeah. Glad he's doing okay. <laughs> yeah, he's great. He, he hears way too many things from <laughs> perfect hearing. <laughs> Um, so some myths about ear infection. I mean, a middle ear infection, people think you can't go swimming. You can. That balloon, you know, is in place. The infection's behind it. So nothing's getting in your ear. Um, you can fly with an ear infection. Obviously, it's better if it's being treated just because that pressure can be a little painful, but it's not a contraindication to flying. Um, people think certain foods cause ear infections. They haven't been shown to, to be anything with that. Um, and, and there's ear um, drops that claim to prevent ear infections. I've heard people putting garlic in their ear. Again, we're talking about ear infections that are behind the balloon. So nothing you put in your ear is really going to get to that ear infection and just kind of, you know, not be great. So, so we'd advise against that. And then ear infections um, themselves aren't contagious, but sometimes the viruses that cause them are. So if your kid has an ear infection, but otherwise is doing okay, they can play with other kids. They don't need to stay out of school or daycare or anything like that. Thank you for that info. And your the ears reminded me of a question that we had about cleaning ears and recommendations for how to clean um, appropriately what you would what you should do, what you shouldn't do, any tips? Sure, yeah, it's sort of like, uh, you know, kind of gone out of favor to clean ears. I think we were in the past, you know, sticking things in kids' ears and causing more damage than good. Um, so generally, we, we really don't recommend Q-tips, not even those like baby safe Q-tips. You sort of just let it be. Um, and some kids create more earwax, some kids don't, some kids have white earwax, some kids have brown earwax. It's sort of like tomatoes, tomatoes. Um, it's not indicative that there's a problem. Um, if there's a ton of earwax, I mean, you know, um, you can talk to your pediatrician about it. Sometimes people use like a, something called Debrox, which is over the counter. It's like a watered down hydrogen peroxide that can sort of dissolve the wax and kind of like, you know, um, it seeps out on its own. So again, sort of like we try to like have it leave your body instead of like forcing it out with the device. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so the next topic is strep throat. Um, this is actually for a little bit of older kids, usually like kids three and up, but this is a normal throat. And then you see on the other side, swollen tonsils, white pus, red angry throat, and that's strep. Um, so Strep throat usually starts quickly. It like you have fever, you can't swallow, it hurts. Usually you have swollen lymph nodes on your neck. And sometimes even if you open your mouth big, you know, you can see the pus or the big tonsils. Um, and things that usually aren't associated with strep throat are cough, runny nose, or, or pink eye. Cause oftentimes we sort of talked about in colds and seasonal allergies, you can get a sore or scratchy throat more from like a post nasal drip. Um, so, you know, kind of if you're having a cough and a runny nose and a sore throat, more likely it's a cold or allergies than it's strep. And if your child is under three, it's almost, it's very unlikely that it's very strep. unlikely. Yeah. Is there exactly. a reason for that? Yeah. So, uh, you know, kids really like under three, really under two can't, um, uh, don't have the proteins to get really sick from strep throat. Um, so you don't test, you don't treat. Um, they're sort of protected, which is cool. To be three forever. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so how do you get diagnosed with strep throat? Uh, you you got to go to the office and get swabbed. Um, we put a little stick in the back of the throat and we test it usually right there. Um, there's a rapid test that's pretty accurate. There's also a send out if you need confirmation. Um, it's most common in school age kids like ages five to 15. It's rare in anyone less than three. Um, and being around other kids that have strep throat is usually how they get it. Um, it's treatable with uh, penicillin or the liquid version of amoxicillin, um, and you treat it because it decreases how long you're sick, decreases the symptoms, decreases the spread to others, and decreases the complications of strep, which is like rheumatic fever, scarlet fever, things we don't really hear about anymore because we're good at treating strep. Um, so once you're on antibiotics, you can go back to school. They work within 24 hours, so you feel good, which is great. Um, sort of the magic number four here, if you get more than four strep infections in a year, you may want to consider seeing your trusty ENT um, because uh, maybe it's the anatomy of your tonsils. They're a little big and, you know, they sort of take in the strep a little bit easier than smaller tonsils, tonsils would. So um, sometimes people do get them out for that reason. Um, but, uh, you know, there also are people who are strep carriers, which isn't necessarily a problem. The only way you would know that is if you go see your pediatrician, if your kid has a lot of infections, and then you go see your pediatrician when they're not feeling any symptoms, you get a swab, and then you can confirm if you're a strep carrier or not, and, and make a plan based on that situation. Oh, wow. Is strep, strep, I, my family got strep all the time when we were growing up and I just felt like it was instantly contagious. Is it one of the more quickly contagious? Yes. Did you say that? Yes. yes. It's funny. You'll be in the office one day and then like a whole class will sort of roll through. So it's, it's typical, typically like the kindergarten, first grade age group. Yeah. And now I, I'm going to completely, I'm not going to derail you because we're going to get right back on track, but, um, bringing when you're coming into the office and obviously you, you, as a parent, you're sharing all the symptoms and are you, um, is your office moving away from just doing a COVID test right away or are you just out of precaution, just always doing that, uh, doing a testing? Yeah, it, it's sort of um, still case by case. I think previously we were swabbing anything and anyone, but now, you know, you can sort of say, okay, this kid has seasonal allergies, they have itchy eyes, yes, they're coughing, but they don't have a fever. You know, they you sort of take exposed in- to anyone, my yeah. vaccinated, yeah. I mean, as the levels in the community drop and more and more adults get vaccinated, I think, um, you know, last week was the first time we had zero COVID tests positive COVID tests in the office, which was like a huge milestone. Um, that doesn't mean we weren't swabbing kids. I mean, I swabbed four kids today, um, but it's just not as prevalent in the community. So um, the nice thing is that the tests are quick. They're coming back quicker. So we still are erring on the side of caution a lot of times, but um, you know, if somebody, for instance, had a positive strep you can and the symptoms, you can say, all right, it's strep throat where maybe a few months ago, we were still also doing a COVID to rule that out. Sure, sure. that makes sense. Thank you for that. Sure. Another good, good yes. time of the year. <laughs> yes, so every fall and winter flu season comes um, and basically the flu is like a shorter, more intense cold. So it usually lasts three to five days more instead of like seven plus days. Um, and uh, you get higher fevers, you're just achier, you're weaker, muscle pain, cough, um, and the complications can be like if the mucus settles in your chest and pneumonia or you know, ear infections as well. Um, so how do you um, test for flu? Um, you, know, you basically go to your pediatrician and, and get a swab up your nose. Um, but you know, in, in, in the past, we don't always really treat the flu. Um, Tamiflu is the only medicine that is a treatment for the flu, but it really, I, we find that the negative side effects often outweigh its use. So unless your kid is really um, predisposed for getting super sick from the flu, meaning they're like young, under two, 
premature history of asthma, we generally really don't prescribe Tamiflu. So, um, you know, knowing the diagnosis doesn't necessarily change the treatment. Um, how do you prevent yourself from getting the flu? Get vaccinated. Vaccines are awesome, which we'll go into in a minute. Um, but the way that the flu vaccine is made every year is they kind of look in the South, you know, South America, see the more virulent strains and try to guess what's going to be in our population. Um, and they make a new vaccine every year because immunity wanes and every year, you know, the viruses or, or the strains that are most prevalent are different. Um, so that's why you have to get a flu shot every year. And you want to get it before it's prevalent in your community. So like, you know, August, September, early October is ideal. That was just going to be my question. <laughs> Um, so this sort of leads us into vaccines in general. Um, you know, vaccines, of course, I think are, are honestly the most wonderful advancement of modern medicine. And, and it's as a pediatrician, I feel so privileged and honored to be able to give vaccines and protect my, you know, patients from all these things um, that they don't have to get anymore. So um, in general, the FDA requires years of research and trials before release. Obviously with the COVID vaccine, things have been sped up, but I honestly feel that this vaccine is under more scrutiny um, than any other one has been in the past. So I'm very pro COVID vaccine as well as other vaccines. Um, and the most common side effects of a vaccine are, you know, nobody likes getting them. So everybody gets a little bummed out, even my own kids. Um, and, you know, you can get a little swelling at the spot. Um, sometimes you can get a fever or a rash, but it's usually quick side effects for a really um, good payoff. Uh, so if you look at the uh, CDC pediatric vaccine schedule, it can be a little overwhelming. Um, we don't have to spend much time on this slide, but basically you get vaccinated for a bunch of different diseases and there's booster doses. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, um, it sort of spells out our schedule at Tribeca Pediatrics. We kind of go in line with the CDC, but again, we try to space things out in a way that we're not giving like six vaccines at one visit and one at the next, you know, um, but we're also trying to protect kids for the diseases that are mo they're most susceptible to at the right time. So we really do follow the CDC recommendations and, and all pediatricians will um, and Basically, at every well visit your kid has until they're six. Well, you get a break. You get a break till five. You get vaccinated till four or five. Then you get a break for a few years. Eleven, some more come around, and uh, yeah. But the first five years of life, you get a lot of shots. The first five years of life, I would say that first year, or even in the, the span of the first nine months, feels like it's a lot, but it's expected, and it's um, yes. it's almost. I think worse for you when they're younger and then as they get older, they start to understand what's happening and then it's, it gets more worse for them. But so even though there's a lot happening at once, it seems to be um, yeah. harder on you sometimes. Yes, yes. And a lot of it's boosters too. So it's just, you know, your kid has some protection, but they need a little boost to, to get full protection. That makes sense. Um, so some myths about vaccines, do they cause autism? Uh, firm no on that. Um, you know, the doctor who concluded that was uh, an association um, had his license taken away and was found to be like creating false data. Um, I think, you know, some of the associations with autism are related to like the one year vaccines, which is the MMR vaccine. Um, just, I think it's often you can sort of see more obvious signs of autism at that age group because that's when kids are kind of starting to like walk and talk and develop social relationships. So I think it's more of just, you know, that's the one that's given at the time where, where you sort of start to see signs of autism is my personal opinion. But uh, no, I, I don't think any vaccine causes autism. Um, people are concerned about the additives in, in vaccines, um, but uh, Thamersil and most additives actually have been eliminated. Um, the vaccines, you know, I got when I was a kid had like way more crap in it than the ones that kids get now. Um, so we've really tried to like go preservative free and, you know, the least amount of additives as possible. Um, diseases uh, are not caused by vaccines. They're like killed, fake, dead, versions of um, the viruses and uh, in the vaccines. 
Um, so that's a myth. Um, people think sometimes splitting it up is better. Um, that's not always the case either. Sort of just creates more visits, more trauma, more side effects. And sometimes if you split things up, you're actually increasing the amount of additives your child's getting because you're not getting the combination shots, which you know kind of group things together and, and decrease the amount of additives. So also a point to make there. Um, also people think that, you know, not vaccinating will only affect their children. And as you can see, that's not true. Um, I think COVID has hopefully brought positive light to, to vaccines um, and how important they are. And hopefully uh, we can figure out how to add kids to the equation of vaccination for COVID. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to just oh. jump into here. That's okay. <laughs> Moving on to uh, these beautiful Bye. pictures. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So these are the common spots for a certain type of rash, um, usually on flexural surfaces. So behind elbows and creases, little like cute, like thigh folds of babies um, and on cheeks and drooly spots. And then if you go to the next slide, there's some more pictures of this particular rash. Um, we've been seeing a big increase on hands, lots of hand washing, but it can be all over the body. And, and you know, basically this is eczema. So you can go to the next slide. Sure. Um, Eczema, eczema usually starts when babies are around three months and can last forever, but it generally gets better over time, which is good to remember. Um, itching and scratching it kind of increases the inflammation process. Um, so you're trying to kind of keep the skin smooth and hydrated as much as possible. Um, and there are many causes of eczema, um, food allergies, but it's not a common cause. People I think think it's a little bit more common than it is. Um, soaps, warm weather, cold weather is another trigger. So, you know, some people it's warm, some people it's cold. Um, irritation from just rubbing like a diaper or a wet bathing suit. Um, and then when you're sick, viral infections can, you know, and what about, I guess, warm weather and like moist, like if, if they're, they're moist, sweaty, sweaty or like really, yeah, moist, sweaty spots. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what do you do for eczema? It's kind of a chronic thing. You kind of have to just be vigilant and on top of it. So moisturize, moisturize, moisturize. Um, we recommend more of the ointments, even though they're kind of slimy, the aquaphor, the Vaseline, the A and D, and then for flares when that's just not cutting it. You can do a little bit of a topical steroid for a few days, sort of a little burst to kind of calm the inflammation process down and then go back to the moisturization. Um, for really extreme cases, there are oral steroids or oral antihistamines we use an adjuvant to the topical treatments, um, just keeping your skin hydrated. And then um, there's like injectables that you'd be seeing a dermatologist for at that point. Um, all right, so this is another common pediatric rash that looks pretty gross, um, but uh, it's usually around the nose and the mouth, uh, places where the skin's a little bit more fragile or there's breaks in the skin. Um, and this is called impetigo. Um, and everybody has normal bacteria that hangs out on our skin, but sometimes when there's an opening, that bacteria can get underneath the skin and cause a problem. Um, so it's common in kids, again, drooly open skin around their nose and mouth. Um, you get these crusted lesions and it can be itchy and, you know, um, infected. Which is so great because all they want to do is touch it, but yeah. all you want to do is say, please don't touch it. Yeah, it's a battle. It's such a battle. Um, <laughs> So what can you do for it? Usually topical treatment works. You use a little bit of topical antibiotic um, over the counter works sometimes. If it's not getting better, see so your pediatrician will write you a prescription for a stronger one. Um, and then in severe cases, sometimes you do need oral antibiotics. Is this something where you could maybe suggest a virtual chat versus a coming in? Is it, have you done that? Totally. Yeah, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's hard to get kids to sit still and like show, you know, their rash on the, on the screens. But even if parents take pictures, um, this is one that, that often you can diagnose um, virtually. Yeah. And it's a quick fix. That's great. Um, this is another common rash we see in kids. It's itchy, it's welts. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, 
it's hives. Um, so causes of hives, generally, um, it's not a big deal. Um, there are four causes of hives. The first one is an allergic reaction. Um, obviously, if it's an allergic reaction to food and your kid's eating it for the first time, this is more of the urgent situation of when you need to be on top of it and see your pediatrician right away. Um, but sometimes kids get allergic reactions to like a cream or a lotion. And then these ones don't usually pro pro uh, progress to like a anaphylactic stop breathing situation. Um, infections are the second common cause of hives. So kids get viral infections, their immune system's tuned up, it overreacts and they break out in hives. Um, it's not dangerous, it's just more irritating for the child. It doesn't mean things are getting worse. And then temperature can cause hives. So hot weather, cold weather, kid jumps in a cold lake, they break out in hives. That's a common story um, or reason for hives. And then the fourth reason is something we call idiopathic. Basically, we don't know, um, but the good news is it's annoying, but it's not dangerous or life-threatening. It sounds like call you if any of this is happening. Yes, yes. Um, the good thing is the treatment is usually over the counter, antihistamines, Benadryl usually does the trick. Um, in severe cases, sometimes you need steroids again to really calm down that over inflammation of the immune system. And if you have hives for more than six weeks, you got to see your doctor, but you've probably seen them by then. Yeah. People don't let things go on for six weeks. <laughs> um, all right. A few summer safety little tips. So sun protection is a big topic. Sorry, I think it's like getting a little dark. So I'm, I'm like sort of fading into the background here. <laughs> okay. uh, but anyways, I'm here still. Uh, so you can use uh, sunscreen in babies less than six months. If you look at sunscreen bottles, it'll say don't use it until babies are six months. That's not true. Um, the active ingredient in barrier sunscreen is zinc oxide, which is the main ingredient in diaper cream. So there's nothing wrong with putting sunscreen on your kid's skin when they're a baby. They just, sunscreen companies don't want babies in the sun. So that's why they write that on the bottle, but don't feel like you can't use it. Um, we suggest barrier uh, sunscreens for young babies. Some examples are Blue Lizard Baby, the Neutrogena Baby Face Stick is another good one you can use in certain spots. And then chemical sunscreens you can use for older, uh, you know, kids, those neutralize the UV rays. Um, you want to do it in SPF of at least 15, reapply it a ton. And the reason we say to avoid spray is um, it can be really irritating for the skin and cause like crazy, itchy, hives, prickly reaction. Um, although it's easy, it, it can be irritating on the skin. Um, all right, so the next summer safety topic is um, water safety. So drowning is the lead cause of injury um, and death in children ages one to four. So you always got to be on top of your kids. You got to watch them. You want to teach them how to swim, um, make sure lifeguards are on duty. And we actually avoid, uh, say avoid using like inflatable swimming aids because it gives kids a false sense that they can swim and be on their own. Um, I mean, they do make the FDA approved like vest ones that you can wear, um, but really um, you just want to try to have your eyes on your kid and uh, uh, you know teach them to swim at a young age. Um, and if you're around a pool, you want to have a fence and a gate that closes. I like the drain cover to stop suction too. That's kind of like the silent yes. one that I wouldn't have thought about. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, all right. So the next thing about summer safety topic is bug bites. So Mosquito bites, I feel like Zika is like, nobody's talking about it anymore, but it was here back. and I think it's still here somewhere. Um, but <laughs> wanna try to, um, you can use uh, mosquito repellent. Um, tick bites um, are definitely a big topic this time of year. And, and really the, the main goal is to cover up. So you're gonna be hiking in the woods, you're gonna be running around long socks, layers, um, but you can use insect repellent spray. Um, in kids as young as, you know, two to three months. Um, and DEET is safe, you know, up to 30%. So people don't think that's safe. It is. You just want to put it on areas where your kid's not putting it in their mouth. Um, and uh, there are other options, uh, you know, that you can use Sawyer lotion, Avon, um, oil of lemon eucalyptus, which is a little more natural, but we suggest it for older kids. Um, and, you know, the really big thing to prevent um, 
tick bites is, is really tick checks. So um, checking your kid every night when you bathe them and strip them down. So if you see a tick on your kid, you wanna get your fine tip tweezers out, grab the tick, pull it out. Um, if a little bit remains in the skin, that's okay. Clean the skin area um, with uh, alcohol swa uh, swabs or you know alcohol pad um, or soap and water. Um, and then you wanna get rid of the tick. Uh, if the tick is attached really for more than 36 to 72 hours, um, is when you want to worry. Of course, if you're like on the edge, it's been more than a day, just call your pediatrician because there are times that, that we will prescribe something like a Lyme prophylaxis if a tick has been there for a long time and you've been in an endemic area, which is honestly most of this area. Yeah. I like the um, idea of like, just um, if you feel on the edge, just give us a call. <laughs> yeah. Else. Yeah. We can reassure you or help you. Yeah, for sure. Um, sorry, it's getting really dark. I can turn the light on myself. There you uh, go. Okay, there we go. Now it's like too, too light. <laughs> anyway, we're making it work. Um, so uh, cuts and scrapes. Um, if your kid falls, uh, you want to put pressure on the wounds as soon as possible. If there's a significant distance between the edges of the wound or you see it spreading apart easily, that's sort of a sign that your child may need stitches, in which case you're going to call us. Um, you know, we do work closely with a few plastic surgeons um, who can like help stitch up our kids, especially when they fall on their face. Um, it's a tough thing to go through, but, um, you know, call us and we'll guide you through it. Um, often if your kid falls and they have a cut in their mouth, it's actually a great place to get hurt. It's rarely infected. It rarely gets stitched. It looks crazy and it can look white and puffy, um, but it's actually one of the safest places to, to hit and fall because the spit irrigates your mouth and, and it's cleaner than you think. Um, scars, you know, hydrate the skin, lots of moisturizing cream, extra sun protection, and there's over-the-counter stuff, but none of it's really been prone uh, shown to work but the nice news is kids heal really well um and do much better than us adults and kids bleed like there's a usually a lot more blood as opposed to the actual i mean not always but i found that there's more happening than what's really happening yeah it looks worse often like initially than it is you know so pressure for a few minutes calm down find your zen take it, it off and then they evaluate yeah, yeah. Um, well, this has been amazing. I know we're we're almost running, we are really running out of time, but what I would like to do is uh, there's a couple questions that came in and, and the way that I can get to them is by um, pausing our uh, slide deck. So I just wanted to go back a little bit. We're going to bounce around really quickly. Sure. Um, uh, question, a very specific question about vaccines, just when are newborns vaccinated enough to be exposed to people without vaccines like Tdap? So entering sure. the social yes. world. Yes. Um, I think people usually use the two month vaccines as a marker of when they can kind of be a little bit more in the outside world. Um, so those are traditionally given up the two month visit and, and you know, um, that's when people would go on a plane or visit relatives in the past. Um, you know, the nice thing is those vaccines can be given as early as six weeks. So if you did have something planned, just know that you can come in a little bit before the two month visit and get them. But yeah, six, six weeks to two months. And do you recommend any adults getting specific vaccines before they see infants? Yeah, I think you'd try to have people teed up, uh, up to date, you know, um, which is the whooping cough vaccine um, and, uh, you know, COVID vaccine for adults who can get it. Great. Um, other questions out there? I know I, I'm keeping everybody on at least three minutes longer, um, but just want to make sure that there weren't any um, other questions that we haven't answered yet very quickly. I'm going to check out my question box to see if we've missed any. And I'll give everybody just a couple seconds in case they want to add anything. Um, and actually, uh, just a question about typical hygiene for infants, like for bathing. And then I know we, we talked a little bit about ears. Um, obviously, the outside of the ears is, is great, but like overwashing, underwashing, when to bath, not when to bath. Yeah, I think... Um... 
babies don't get very dirty. Obviously they can have, you know, newborns, a big spit up or a crazy poop, but uh, generally they don't need to bathe that often. So really like once or twice a week is enough in the beginning. Um, sometimes if you bathe them too much, it can dry out their skin. So when you do bathe them, um, use minimal soap or do the soap at the end. So they're not sitting in, in the soapy water. Um, as your kid gets a little more mobile and eats a lot of solid food, they get a little messier. So it's more of like an every other day situation. Um, but again, you just try to want to try to want to not let them sit in the soapy water because the soap is really what dries out the skin um, for kids. I love that. All the fun things that we think we should do, but we don't actually really need to do. Yes. Yes. And I find, you know, bubble baths like that can really dry out the skin but bath salts aren't as drying. So I've gotten into like a the bath bomb game with my uh, amigos, my three boys, um, although they're expensive, which can be an issue when everybody needs their own. So you bring it out every once in a while when you need that, when you need that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I think we've talked about um, bath bombs in addition to brandy, in addition to some of the top 10 things, and I don't see any other questions coming through. Um, so at this point, I would say thank you so much for giving us um, oh, your no time problem. tonight, um, an extra five minutes. It's been really fun chatting with you. I hope we've given everybody some nuggets and um, some information that they can use, and um, I'm sure we'll be talking to you very soon. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks guys. Have a great night. Good luck. And you're all doing great. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Have a great night. Yeah.